Uh, now, before I hand it over to Greg, please let me properly introduce our guest. Greg is the co-founder and COO of Shopper First, a research company focusing on integrating proven subconscious triggers to purchase, to purchase into communication plans. Greg has previously worked on both P&G and J&J's and global, global shopper teams. His work has been recognized with multiple vendors, vendor of the year awards and leading retailers for design work. And he is a, he's the proud three-time recipient of the J&J North American and Global Shopper Awards. Shopper First specializes in developing claims which overcome barriers to purchase. Greg, as I was mentioning before we jumped on, lots of enthusiasm for this. I think you're really going to uh, impart some wonderful uh, advice and, and just experience for the, uh, the community. So thank you for joining us and uh, I'll hand it over to you to, to take us through. Okay, thanks very much, Lindsay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for, uh, for joining today in advance of the long weekend. So um, my name is Greg White and um, I'm going to show you some things that um, been proven to work to grow the business and I'll I'll do my best to answer questions at the end, show you a number of examples as we go through and just give me a moment here to get things set up. I am battling a little bit of a, a cold or a cough, so I may go from time to time on mute for a moment. OK, the one thing I would recommend, guys, is um, the, the theories and some of the principles and examples I'm going to show you may relate to a particular category, but they may have very different application for you uh, in the audience. So uh, I recommend you probably have a lot of brainstorming ideas on how these things can relate to your brand. And uh, again, we'll have lots of time at the end to uh, to discuss in more detail. OK, so. The first piece I just wanted to tee up. You know, CHFA, what kind of brands are you working on? And while this won't include every single brand, I'm, I'm trying to generalize who I'm talking to. And one, we've got a great brand. There's a lot of upside potential. The people who who um, use our brand have strong positive feelings towards it. They really like it. The trade development is is good and growing. We might either want to expand existing distribution or distribution in our existing retailers or grow a distribution elsewhere. And you know who your consumer target is. So a lot of companies I talk to that are small to medium sized businesses, they know who their core is. There's also there's often questions from some of the owners or leaders of those businesses. We think that the secondary targets who also might like our brand are these people, but we're not really sure. So all of these things are you know, are great. The one question that not many people ask is, and I'll ask you guys right now, you don't need to answer. Do you know how your shopper shops? Do you know when they go online or when they go into a store to look at your product? Do you know their actual shopper behavior? And this is a question a lot of people, um, if you look up here on the left-hand side, this diagram explains this. A lot of great brands have great consumer marketers they understand who their consumer is. Um, they know all sorts of things about him or her. They also know on the retail execution side, um, you know, the price points, the promotional volume, where, where they want to be shelved, etc. But not many people understand the shopper and how they shop. And so that's where I'll come in. From a, a specific, you know, this is theory, a specific example I'll show you is this. And uh, we'll we'll revisit this as well, but the, um, the the your brand has a visual, and if you were to use a white piece of paper with pencil crayons and ask people in your category to draw it, what would they draw? And in this case, for Tropicana, they um, they would draw things like the orange and um, the green text. And if you look around, only the media looks like the product that they've taught people on what it looks like. Excuse me, everything else is fairly disconnected. And so you want your brand to be as consistent as possible because ultimately this is what you've taught them in their long term memory to go and find when they go to buy it at shelf. <clears throat> Pardon me. So just a little bit of background on me. Um, I've been trained by a PhD in shopper psychology. I've got something that's called the a master practitioner certification in neuro linguistic programming, which is how the brain receives messages. As Lindsay mentioned, I've worked on both the J and J and ENG uh, global shopper teams, and we've done some work with Shoppers Drug Mart, 
Walmart, uh, J and J, and and have been recognized for the work that we've done. And I always, whenever I mention this part here at the bottom, I always mention it's not meant to brag in any way. It's meant to demonstrate that when you apply shopper in the right way, it can build the business and is recognized, you know, externally. So it really boils down, guys, to three things. And this is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Number one is packaging recognition. Unless your product gets recognized, you will never get bought. The second piece is we are a risk averse species. We don't like to take risks and claims overcome the barriers to purchase. So you need to understand those barriers. And the third piece is consistency or integration of your brand. If you can get those three things right, and those are the three things I'll talk about today, you're going to uh, amplify your consumer and your retail investments that you're already making with virtually no incremental investment. What, what are these two pieces down here? Well, this is where you apply them in in-store and e-com, and I'll give you some examples on that today. So from, um, from a, a shopper psychology perspective now, we're going to get into this. I've probably presented this type of material four or 500 times to probably four or five, 6,000 people. I'm not really sure. Um, this is a probably a 25 minute version where we'll typically do something like in, in an hour and a half just on claims or shopper psychology. But I'm going to go through the three principles with you now. It should be a little bit of fun for you as well. And we'll start with the woman on the left here. Uh, she's got a smartphone. She can buy things five different ways. Uh, very sophisticated. But the thing that we often forget is her brain works very much the same as the people on the right who used to live in caves. So let's dig a little bit more deeply into the people on the right. And I'm just going to talk three of these theories. The first piece is limited glucose. So if you've ever heard of the statistic that our brains weigh about 2% of our body weight, but they can consume up to 20% of our calories in a day, we are trained as a species to not use our brains to think unless we absolutely have to. So I'm just going to peel the onion on that a little bit. Um, these people obviously didn't have grocery stores that they could leave in the morning and go shop at. And before agriculture was invented, um, they didn't have a, a reliable food source. And so when there was lots of food around, they didn't have to worry about thinking. But lots of other times when there was famine, if they thought too much, they could literally starve themselves to death. So our brains only like to think unless we have to. And this is how we shop. I'll show you an example in a moment. The second piece is shelter equals comfort. So if you think back to when you were in high school, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the number one thing we have to do as a species is survive. And part of that survival is building a shelter that's safe. And we typically you know, live in that shelter. So we see it every day. And they are these recurring consistent visuals that bring us comfort. The further away we go from our shelter into unknown territory, the more danger exists. So if you are known and comfortable and seen often in a consistent way, you're more likely to elicit um, emotions of comfort and be purchased. Um, and then the third one is prey equals extinction. So the same reason these people might go out in the morning to look for food, they could also be food. And so if you think about the largest animals, uh, you know, in the jungle, like a rhino or a gorilla or an elephant, they're all one color. And the, the, the animals that blend in are camouflaged. They have to, to survive. And so we're also wired through our defense mechanism that if we see a large block of color, it could be a threat and it makes us look. And there's also some implications on how to get noticed in store um, with large blocks of color, which I'll show you in a few minutes. So I'm just gonna talk through these for a little bit, have a little bit of fun. Um, the first thing I'm gonna do there's far too many people on the call to actually have a contest. If we were all in person, we could do this, but we'll go on the honor system. I'm going to show you 16 sets of three letter combinations on the next screen. I'm going to leave them on the screen for 15 to 20 seconds. And your challenge is to learn as many of them as you can in the time I'm giving you. I'll then take them off the screen. You can write them down and we can compare notes at the end. OK, so no writing yet. You can start and see how many you can learn in the next 15 to 20 seconds. Okay, 
take those off. You can write them if you're young in your phone or if you're old, write them on a piece of paper with a pen. And um, just for, for the sake of time, guys, I'll pull these back up and um, I'll, I'll explain to you what typically happens. Um, most people get four or five. The conscious brain can remember between three and seven things. We're in an academic setting, so it's probably closer to four or five versus three. And when I ask people which ones they got, most people will say, you know, these two, if you're Canadian, you'll get that one there. You'll, you'll sometimes, for similar reasons, get that one. Uh, no one ever gets XJW. In fact, one person I've shown ever has gotten XJW. And so what I asked you to do and what you actually did are two different things. I asked you to learn as many of them as possible, but all your brain did was recall what it already has learned and discarded everything else. And that has really profound implications for people who are shopping and trying to find your product. So that there is Coke you know that that's Coke instantly without the red label or the name because you've memorized the shape and you've seen it you know, thousands of times. This is ketchup, it's Heinz ketchup. No red color, no label, but you've memorized the shape. And so you might say, well, of course I know those two because they're unique shapes. Well, let me show you um, a different example with Kit Kat. This was actually done by the professor, Dr. Hugh Phillips of Shopper Psychology. He showed this product here to uh, respondents in research for a fraction of a second and asked them what it was. And 97%, if you can see his, his uh, chicken scratch there, 97% of respondents knew it was Kit Kat. Then all he did, if you notice this picture up here, to a different group, he showed that visual for the exact same amount of time and only 36% of people knew that that was Kit Kat. So Kit Kat essentially lost two thirds of its business by not recognizing how important color was to its findability subconsciously. Just the way you looked at dog and mom and discarded XJW, this for the consumer is dog or mom and this is XJW. The, the problem is that Kit Kat actually launched an orange product and at first, it's not a great picture, but they launched with all orange and it bombed. Um, no one saw it, it didn't do well. They did some packaging research afterwards and it showed that they should start with red and then blend it into orange on the side. Uh, this one here, you know, I used to work on Pringles a long time ago and uh, a marketer might say, you need the Pringle guy's face on because that's our brand equity. In fact, the recognition only goes down two points when you take the face away. But when you put the face back on and put in a blue carton, recognition that it's Pringles goes to 9%. So Pringles owns the shape. So my challenge to all of you listening to this is to understand what your known visuals are. And in the case of like an iconic brand like Gatorade, everyone writes a G in the middle. Everyone puts an orange cap on the top. Uh, the colors are different, but you know, there's certain things they own and there's certain things they don't own. For a, a smaller brand like Motrin, it's different depending who's drawing the picture. And so if you're a smaller brand, um, I would encourage you to look at who, who's buying your brand now and ask them what visual equities uh, they that you own by seeing what they draw and make sure that that is stitched in throughout your brand's ecosystem. I'll show you a couple of other examples. Uh, the architecture of Cheerios, it's done really well here. Um, you've got Cheerios across the top in the same place. Instantly, you know it's Cheerios because we've learned that name when we were you know, eating breakfast when we were younger. And uh, the flavors are different. Whereas this one here with um, V8, they've done a really nice job on low sodium here. But this one here has virtually no visual equities that have been established by the parent brand. There's this here, but as quickly as you might look when you're shopping subconsciously, you're not going to see that. And the, the only other thing I'll talk before I shift gears here on packaging is a lot of the people that do packaging design work, their job is to develop beautiful packaging, uh, not necessarily packaging that works the hardest for the shopper. So this Tropicana example uh, really leverages zero elements from the base package into its its new package. And so it's really got to work a lot harder for people to know that that's Tropicana. So the first uh, summary on limited attention, our brains don't like to think the same way you didn't look at the letters you've never seen before. That will also happen to your packaging if people don't know it. 
So leverage learned images, understand what colors you and shapes you own, always use pictures instead of words. And there are really big, big brands we work with still that will have eight to 15 things on their package because they just want to use every piece of real estate. Our brains only want to think on three or four things. So you've got to be really choiceful. And I would recommend, you know, the rule of three. What are the three big messages you want to convey versus, you know, eight or 10 messages that uh, you think are all important? The shopper just won't see it. The second piece, peripheral vision. Does anyone know what that that is there? I'll give you a couple seconds to look at it and then I'll tell you it's a dog, Dalmatian, I believe, drinking out of a puddle. There's its legs, there's its its spine, its collar. And a lot of people will look at that and not know what it is because humans need outside lines to see things. In more practical senses, uh, sense planes were painted like farmer's fields in the war so they could be blended in and not get shot down. And as we talked about getting eaten for lunch, we are wired as a species that if we were to walk out of our cave or be, be walking anywhere and there's a large block of color in our peripheral vision, we will look because our defense mechanism is always on. So how does this relate to, to shopping? Well, if you look in picture number three, if you walk down that aisle, your environment really never changes. It's just blue the whole time. And so there's no threat. Whereas here, first it's a big block of blue, then there's a block of green. And we've done a lot of camera work to show that it makes people look. And when people look at a category, then you're, you're being considered. Do I need that category or this brand today? And it's been shown to grow category four to eight percent when you can vertically block one of the bigger brands in the in the category. What if you're not one of the bigger brands? Get near one of the bigger brands you compete against because that's what's going to attract attention. Uh, this is an example, actually. Dr. Phillips ran this in the UK on like a Dateline show, and what he did was um, he broke up the beans category here. Heinz is the number one brand in the UK. He broke it up into four different sections. Didn't change anything else, just moved, moved them and broke up the brand block and the entire category went down 16%. Next one's on signposting. We all have cognitive maps in our minds that form without us even trying. Um, we know how to get to our local coffee shop or to the hockey arena or, or, or you know, our friend's place. And uh, the example I give is if, can you tell me where the Home Depot paint department is? And what you're doing right now is accessing a cognitive map because you've been to Home Depot probably, and it's in the same place in every store. And so it's there whether you realize it or not, but they've signed it properly and they've created that map for you. So from um, a retail perspective, I'm gonna talk e-com in a moment. This is a Finnish retailer. You, you guys probably can't speak Finnish, but you can tell me where the pet food aisle is instantly. This is an example, if you look at the Ola Volley sign, Walmart did some work many years ago with uh, re realizing that females who wanted premium beauty brands did not give Walmart credit for having those brands in their store. So they made all the vendors develop signs for their section. But what Walmart had the vendors do was put up these orange signs. Now, if you've all been looking at that screen, your eye is automatically attracted to the, the black oil of LA sign versus the orange one. So a question I'll ask you is, of all of the POP and communication you're developing, how much of it is existing is leveraging existing pathways versus trying to teach people new things which are likely going to be ignored? Um, you can do things like that in the aisle. And, and importantly, I'm going to spend some time here. Uh, this is just an example of great signposting on e-com. So most brands that I see when they have their website or, or DTC, they typically communicate to their, their potential shopper with a long list of words of all the categories they can buy there. It doesn't incorporate um, deselection or some of the main categories and help people get to their choice faster. So this is a great example of using um, imagery and, and signposting on, on .com to drive more engagement and a quicker purchase. I'm pausing every few seconds for a little cough when I mute, just so you guys know. Um, the next piece is probably the most important piece. It's the simplest piece and it'll have the biggest impact, which is claims. So, um, and again, it's one of the three pieces. It overcomes the barrier to purchase. And what a claim is, is um, it, it, it differentiates 
your product or service versus competition and addresses the shopper's barrier to purchase. Um, in general, claims are underutilized. They're misunderstood because most people think that you need to say that you're technically superior to your competition. And if you can get the right claim, it doesn't really cost you anything other than getting the right claim because it goes on all of your existing assets anyway. So it makes everything else work harder. And how claims work, um, you know, think of one of your key competitors right now and why that shopper buys your competitor. They currently buy A because their belief is X, whatever that is. The job with claims is to change that belief to Y so that they will then buy B, which B would be your brand. And so there's lots of different ways to develop claims. I'm going to zip through these kind of quickly. Um, and, and you don't start here. This is where you end. You first need to understand the shopper barrier, but category education using two things together. Band-Aid and Polysporin is 50% faster healing. So uh, I was only going to go in and buy Band-Aid today, but I bought two things. It, it grew the basket. 10 times stronger hair is, is a multiplier. And the reason the asterisk is there, if you ever look at, uh, say, a Shoppers Drug Mart or Costco, and you go into the hair care section, you'll see a lot of multipliers. And that asterisk is there because it's a comparison versus a, an existing formulation within that manufacturer's product uh, lineup. 100% satisfaction guarantees work really well when you've got a great product that not many people know about and they believe something that's more stand, you know, established is better. So the, the product experience typically works best there. Competitive comparison. So our fastest internet guaranteed. If you've got a good brand uh, with good equity, that, that can really work by saying this is our best. Time frame to see results depends on the category. Uh, convenience messages. So you know, I was maybe going to Canadian Tire this weekend because it's it's uh, spring and I'm going to buy some hedge clippers. And I see a claim that says it's going to take me 80% less time if I buy one of the automated battery charged hedge trimmers. So that helps me trade up. And then obviously with all the things that are going on in social channels now, social proof or third party endorsement can really work as well as long as they're credible. OK, we'll get into some pictures again. Um, so how claims work? Go into Costco. I don't really care which cleaner I'm going to buy. I like Pine Sol. I like Mr. Clean. And Pine Sol says the power of Pine Sol, the smell of clean. And Mr. Clean uses its corrugate to say kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria. If you're undecided before you went in, which one would you buy? This was before COVID, by the way, this picture. But most, pretty much everyone says I would buy Mr. Clean. Um, another example, skincare. Not really sure what I'm getting in the bottle. Olay says visible wrinkle results start day one. Um, L'Oreal has Andy McDowell with number one anti-aging skin cream and a value message here. And then Elizabeth Arden, which you can see on the pack over here, it's using its corrugate to also say that it's Elizabeth Arden in case you weren't sure that it was Elizabeth Arden on the package. So I don't know if L'Oreal or Olay would finish first, but I, I'm pretty sure that Elizabeth Arden would finish third as far as convincing undecided buyers to buy their brand. Remember the three letter combinations. I'm going to show you a great example of a claim and what I think is a claim that there's POP where there's just far too much on there. So on Gillette, I go back to get my prescription. I think this is CVS in the US. Um, I no longer buy razors in a drugstore because they're too expensive. And this is new lower prices. Three words, brand colors. You've got the, the, the visual of the razors, which you probably see in your washroom. And uh, it overcomes the barrier, addresses the barrier to purchase. Band-Aid, this is, I think, an 8,000 Walgreens. You've got, we've got your family covered. You've got four icons. Be prepared for life's adventures. Number one doctor recommended and stick with it all on one piece of um, corrugate. And so, again, I'll go back to those three letter combinations. Which one will your brain absorb subconsciously, which is how we shop, and which one will just be discarded because there's just too much and our brains don't like to think. So um, if you've got a larger brand with multiple segments, there's probably claims for each different type of consumer you're going after. And so there's ways to grow mature brands in multiple segments. We do lots of research in claims, and I can tell you that taglines while important for your brand character outside of store, as people are about to part with their money and pick between a product and its competitor, taglines actually decline brand choice. 
Said another way, it would be better to say nothing at all than to put your tagline on the on the um, the uh, corrugate or your communication. A couple of other examples. So some self comparative claims cleans up to four times more surface area. That's versus base Swiffer. People ask me, is that not misleading? Not if I've got a you know two golden retrievers and a six thousand square foot uh, hardwood floor to to clean up all the time. Uh, Fifty percent more grease uh, than than based on. Three times more film fighting power. It may not bake by Cascade that day, but it slightly built the equity when I walked by it. Performance claims. So this could be more in the health food space, but supports the five signs of joint health. Anytime you can put a numeric on a claim, it's going to give you more credibility. Um, absorbs 10 times its weight. So there's ways, creative ways that you can communicate benefit here. Um, and then in some categories, for, you know, plant-based, for example, there's just the cost of entry. I'm not even considering this product unless it doesn't have ax. And you can see here, 0% perfumes and dyes, for example. Um, guarantees, as I mentioned earlier, try me or your love or your money back. Um, love the taste or your money back. Typically a great way to drive confidence because we are you know, risk averse. We like to avoid um, making a mistake twice as much as we would uh, you know, be motivated for a gain. Value message. Get the instant results of the number one prestige I or meet without paying twice as much. It's a nice value reframe there um, from a brand probably in a, in a prestige channel. Claims results. Um, we'll show these three products in research and we'll have, this is real results by the way, 25% of people said, you're not tricking me. I know all that stuff in the vitamin bottle is the exact same. And so 25% of people picked uh, Walmart Echinacea. We then show the exact same visuals, but with the claim that the product uses um, on its package. And only 11% of people picked Echinacea. So the claim alone took this product from 25% brand choice to 11% brand choice. And you might say, well, okay, that's, that's in research for one category, but we've done this work across a number of categories. And just to explain this on nutrition bars, Cliff, Kind, and Kashi, we put into research product alone. And then we did another set of research with their claims and Kind Bar's brand choice went up 30%. Makita's drill went up 62% with its claim versus the one that Ryobi and DeWalt are using, et cetera. Uh, almond butter, Justin's one, 46%. So the thing that I want you to take away from this is don't just throw a claim on your product. Do as much work as you can to really understand competition, what your barrier is, and refine that communication to maximize this number because it really does pay out. And in real life, uh, this is a client of ours we've worked with in the last year. Their claim that they're using in market today is 40% brand choice versus their key competitor at 60%. We tested six other claims, and as you can see on the blue bar, the one you know one of them at 54% brand choice versus their competitor at 46 was a 133 index versus what they're in market with today. So that's a big part of it on claims. I'll be about probably seven or eight more minutes, and we can field for questions. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about claims design now. And if you look at that uh, screen there, it's on for maybe two and a half seconds. Again, too many people on the call to ask, but what was the claim? So some people may have seen it. I think a lot of people may not have. And we're in a claims workshop. You're looking at your screen, hopefully. And I asked you um, to look at the at the picture, but you didn't see the claim or a lot of you didn't. And why? Because the claim is down here. And if I can just explain how our brains subconsciously work, we will always look at pictures before we look at words because we don't like to think. We'll look at known visuals um, before we look at visuals that we've never seen before. So in the, the two to two and a half seconds that was on there, everyone's eye would have went there first and some of you may have went down there. Now, behind this purple piece of cardboard is four to eight feet of Pantene. You do not need another sign with your brand on it to show people where Pantene are. The shelf's doing that for you. Probably 85, maybe 90% of Canadians do not wash their hair with Pantene. 
And this claim of 100% stronger hair at the bottom should be very prominent in, in um, the middle of that, uh, that card. Another example, children's Advil. If you look at that and ask what was the claim, most people will see it right away, eight hour fever relief. And what Advil does really well is this isn't just on their displayers, this is on their package, it's in their copy, it's on their web, it's in their content, and they've got a real advantage over children's Tylenol, which, which lasts for four hours. So the way our eye works is basically looking at that, where you need to understand the hierarchy of how our brain has no choice but to read. And so a lot of um, claims are either buried or hidden and never seen, or they're not the right claim in the first place. I'll give you an example. I'm going to give you a couple of examples before I finish on real life situations. So when I was at J&J &J many years ago, uh, I oversaw not the consumer group or the sales teams, but, but every other function in the middle. And I had a, a marketer come to me on the Motrin business and say, hey, we're doing a coupon uh, next year and uh, we weren't really happy with our performance this year. So she said, this is our coupon from last year. I think it was on a shopper's drug mart in um, December and we were $3 off and we only grew 10% and we think we can do better. And what should we do differently in this communication? And so not knowing the brand as well as her, I just asked some questions from a shopper perspective. And I said, what are people looking for when they go shopping in this aisle? And she said, well, Advil. And I said, okay, so what color is Advil? Advil's blue. Okay. So the brain, discards everything it doesn't need because it doesn't want to think. So unless you're blue, I'm not looking at you because I want to get Advil and get on with my day. So what we did was we came out with a blue backer card and we couldn't put the brand logos on, but we use the, the liquid gels um, because anyone who takes a pain tablet looks at it in their hand before they put it in their mouth. And so we use some, some known visuals. We use the colors that were associated with the category and this execution over here on the left grew 10% and this one over here grew 103%. It with everything else was identical. So you've got to get noticed before you get purchased. And then they turned that into a, a claim after that. So a couple components on claims, guys, you really need to understand the barrier or belief that influences your purchase interest. Um, you need to have the right display part, uh, architecture. So that Pantene example of it buried at the bottom was was a good example of it not working as hard as it could. If you can use quantification uh, with with as few words as possible, and then integrate that into your go-to-market plans. The last piece, so we've talked packaging. It's critical to get noticed. We've talked claims in overcoming barriers to purchase. We're gonna talk integration now, and then we'll wrap. Um, so brand integration is the third piece of, call it the three-legged stool. And if we go back to this, you know, we can look at this and a lot of the work we do with, with our clients, we do this type of page for them before or current. And then after we would recommend a number of shopper applications that can help a lot of the stuff they're already doing work harder. And so uh, what we consistently hear back from general managers, VPs is, wow, our brand really is a dog's breakfast. Well, I'm gonna give you a real example. And uh, this one here is a Johnson's baby ad that ran in 2013 and it it uh it was an amazing ad uh, leaders of the company in town halls were showing it and would weep and it was very emotional the company was very proud of it and a year later when i was on the global shopper team i had a chance to present to the the global leadership team and i put this picture up and i i asked the leadership team i said did this tv ad when it was on air did it grow the business and some of the u.s leaders sh shook their head and said our, our market share actually declined when this was on air. And so I said, okay, I didn't know. I'm from Canada, I'm just asking the question. Um, but I said, when I look at at the website, it's not bad for 2013, 14, you know, um, it's got some product, it's got a picture of a baby there. But when I look at the, um, the shelf, and this is Walmart US, so the biggest retailer for Johnson's baby, it just shouts commodity and dog's breakfast. And so what you've got here is you've got an amazing, T piece of TV copy coming out, um, probably millions spent on agency to develop it and many more millions to, sp to buy the media, but there's no connection for mom who's shopping at the shelf, who dearly loves her baby, it's just commodity. And so the, the lack of integration across the touch points 
is an opportunity for most brands we see as it, as it relates to shopper. I'll give you one quick example, then I'll be wrapping. Um, media, Selena Gomez, beautiful, shiny, brunette uh, hair. It's on TV. Okay, I'm going to go look into this Pantene. Maybe I should give it a shot. You go onto their website and they've got, you know, the on equity model shots and the visuals on the left, which is, you know, we like to look from left to right. We like to look at, at pictures of people first, but they've got the associated claim beside it. And then they've got our most awarded collection. Note, it's not the most awarded collection. It's our most awarded collection. And then the banner flips to unbreakable. I might probably have called out the 97% in more detail there. And then when we look at the, what happened with J&J &J Baby, um, you look here, and when you go to Shoppers Drug Mart, you've got Selena Gomez that you maybe saw last night on TV, and you've got her with the two times moisture. And on the other side of that card, you've got the most awarded with the most premium part of that uh, overall uh, Pantene lineup. So one of the things I would strongly recommend to each of you if you're a brand owner, or you work with a brand owner, is put your brand on how it might be drawn on what your own your ownable uh, packaging attributes are from a shopping perspective, and then plot out what your media, your website, your social, your in-store, your DTC, your e-com, plot it out and make sure there's a common thread that links back to that center point. So just to summarize, I got two summary pages and we can open up for questions. If you don't get noticed, you're never getting bought. Once you get noticed, you need to overcome the barrier to purchase for the shopper, not the consumer, but the shopper's barrier to purchase at shelf or while they're shopping for you online. And then I'm sure all of the brands listening do more than just get listed on shelf. I'm sure you've got social presence. I'm sure you've got website. Um, take a look and make sure that your brand is integrated through the shopper's eyes. And then there's things you can do down here, which I briefly touched on, like the Canadian Tire Moto Master uh, Ecom, the website, use signposting there try and get into vertical blocking in store use your pop not to tell your brand name again but use a claim uh, in store uh, to convert people so just to summarize um, the packaging cues be known and be seen um, the claims overcome the shoppers barrier to purchase and then the integration and consistency of communications you know i i probably what was i maybe 30 minutes there on um what would typically take an hour and a half to two hours of in-depth, you know, examples and, and sub theories and whatnot, but it really does all boil down to this. And it's based on a lot of the research that we do with brands that we run through shopper simulations. And we, we consistently come back to these three things are the three most important things to drive your brand choice versus your key competitor. And then that's me in the top left. And um, we've got uh, partners in Europe, the US and Mark here is also in Canada with me. So I will stop and see if there's any questions. Thanks, Greg, that was amazing. Um, and for anyone who joined us a little bit later, uh, just a reminder, you can pop your questions into the chat. Just uh, click on the talk bubble in the top right of your nav and just drop in a question and we'll uh, we'll get going. So. I do have a couple questions uh, to get us started. Um, what are some simple ways that you can start to understand the shopper if you don't have the budget to do, you know, a research study? What would what would be some tips that you could give a smaller brand? The best thing I would recommend is to go into a store, go into the aisle that you compete in, and watch people for fifteen or twenty minutes. And it might seem that in the first two or three minutes you've gotten it. But it's it really is like peeling an onion. I do it all the time. Um, keep watching. Walk when there's no one in the aisle. Walk down the aisle like you're a shopper. Walk back the other way. Uh, even maybe ask people why do you buy this and um, help me understand how you first came to buy it. What would it take for you to buy this? Why would you consider it? Why wouldn't you? But typically observation, if you don't have any other resources at your disposal, is a really great way to get more immersed in the shopper and i can tell you from working for some large companies a lot of marketers when we go in a store would say man i don't do this enough like i just always learn something at, on what's going on at ground zero uh, with my brand because ultimately until people buy something nothing happens it's it's the most important person is the shopper right they, they're the one buying your product so that's that would be my my high level answer 
Amazing. Actually, I have two questions from that one, actually, that are a good segue. So what are you looking for when you are just observing someone? So you're not talking to them. Are there are there key things you're looking for? Yeah, I would look at um, a lot of the theories we just talked. So uh, at f the very first piece is you've got to be noticed. So if you are in a camouflage shelf configuration, say in the bottom part of the shelf, which is probably the one of the worst places to be, and you're not near the bigger key competitor, just saying you're a smaller brand, you could have the best claim in the world, you can integrate, you could have great social, but if people can't find you, it doesn't matter. So the number one piece is I need to get noticed. And some of the, sometimes the packaging you should ask yourself, is it recessive? Is it standing out? Is it, you know, is it conveying the things I needed to convey? Because on a desktop, when you have approved the packaging, it might look great, but ultimately the shopper subconsciously looking at things with their peripheral vision is where it needs to be picked up. So I would look at that. I would look at the claim. So I would pick up the packet, the, your brand, and I'd pick up the competitor's brand and see what is the shopper reading from both of these. Uh, I would look at that. I would look at um, probably the SKU lineup and there's some things around value. And like, if you have an entry point SKU, what are you doing to get them into the brand? And then what are you getting to do to trade them up within your brand? So, but typically I, it starts with awareness and engagement. And what do I need to do to change that? Amazing. And so the second question to that actually was around what if your brand and uh, your, sorry, your consumer and your shopper are really different? How do you kind of marry those two things? So you stay true to your brand from the consumer's perspective, but you do get that shopper to pick up the product. How do you, do you have any tips for that? Sorry, my mute button wasn't working, so I took my That's headset okay. off. <laughs> yeah. So there's a few examples there. Um, I'll think of two, and if someone has an ex a specific category, I'm happy to answer it. But there's things like baby formula, where the consumer is the baby and the mom is the con is the shopper. There's protein powder, where a mom might be picking it up for her her, her teenage son, you know, et cetera. And so there's typically, if it's someone else buying it and they're not as accustomed to what it looks like, it's get the one with the red label. Like that's the one that I want. So those iconic types of shapes that have been learned help other people buy buy for it as well. Um, from a, if the consumer is very different than the shopper, but the consumer, sorry, the, but the shopper is deciding, then you're talking about an uninformed shopper and that's where claims work a lot harder. Mm -hmm. So, wow, it's four times stronger than what well, this feels like this would be good for the person I'm buying this for in my household or it won an award. You know, it must be good. So it gives them that confidence that they're buying something good for them. Yeah, really make it simple for them. They're not yeah. maybe yeah. As, as engaged in the category of the product. So make it simple yeah. for the shopper. Yeah. Um, just a couple questions we're going to read here. So um, this is from someone in the audience. I watch consumers in the aisle. They look at the aisle and they are they they look at the aisle as they are walking and the color of the product label stands out and then the price. We sell a higher price product because it's a real product and not diluted. We have a bright colored label so we can get attention. How can we overcome the hurdle of people looking for the cheapest product? Um, value reframing and um, essentially you control the comparison. So the best example I can give you from the, the deck we just went through was the Olay. It has a certain skin cream chemical that has just as much hydroxy whatever as the $400 skin cream. So if you're a premium and you've got real ingredients in there, there's a way to quantify, you, and I'll make it up, but you might have three times more protein. You might have five times more fiber or something for gut health. There's a way to communicate that difference in a multiplier that will, um, will show the value equation and why you're costing more. The other thing I would say, this is more of a general comment, but in claims, guys, you control the comparison. So you don't necessarily have to compare to the cheapest brand on the shelf. You might have something that you're comparing to that's based in your own lineup and you've plussed up you know, something for one of your better SKUs. But um, as a concept, I would ask you to think about if you control the comparison, then what can you compare to that makes that value equation different? In Olay's case, they're like, I'm going to compare to a $400 Sephora skin cream so that people in Walmart who can't shop at Sephora or who don't want to, 
are feeling like they're getting a really great value. So as opposed to saying, don't buy the $10 screen cream, buy the 30. They're saying, don't buy the 400, buy the 30. So mm -hmm. hopefully that gives you a couple of ideas, at least on thought starters on how to think about that. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, next question is in that J uh, the Johnson and Johnson baby shampoo commercial that you showed. Um, obviously, you showed that there was um, that there wasn't that cohesion across across touch points. Excuse mm -hmm. me. So, what would have been your tips to improve uh, that experience? Um, I would have had the consumer team and the trade team sit down a year before that launch and say, "We want to bring the emotion back into this category," and I would have come up with that great. TV idea, not that I would have come up with that, but um, I would have approached the retailer to say, we think there's a real opportunity to evolve this category. Instead of selling $3 baby wash, we wanna bring the emotion to your store. And we think that you as a retailer will benefit. Here's what we're doing on TV and on our web. Here are some ideas we'd like to work with you to bring this to life in store with some visuals of babies, with some claims on why using, you know, this type of like lavender, baby uh, soap helps the baby sleep better at night, et cetera. And we'd like to do a social campaign with you as well. So that's maybe like call it tier one kind of focus. Mm -hmm. But it if, if you're in a smaller business and you are, um, you know, your three or four leaders of your business are all together. If you're doing something in consumer, think about how you would bring that either to your DTC site or to the retailers that you're partnering with to make them more differentiated in the market than just selling product. Great tips there, yeah, really bring bring that whole experience across every touch point. Um, the next one I have is uh, you've worked with a lot of brands. Uh, what would you say is the number one mistake most brands make? I feel like we may know this one, but it's the number one. Yeah, I I I mean, in a in a word, they don't think about the shopper. And I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, I worked in uh, marketing roles, trade marketing category, sales for the first 12 years of my career. And then I, by fluke, got involved in shopper psychology. And I, I learned it in Western Europe. And when I came back to Canada, I said to my team, we're going to apply these shopper psychology principles all through, you know, every category and retailer we work on, we're going to measure it in it invariably grew the business for the retailer and the brands we worked on. And not to be too long winded on this, but the, the consumer marketing function is a dominant function in most brands. Um, they lead a lot of the thinking and it's super important. And then the trade team is all about executing and shopper just hasn't been a prominent um, strategy for most companies. There are some companies that do it really well. L'Oreal, Colgate, p and would be through. I think Home Depot does a really nice job as well. Um, but it doesn't take a lot of extra effort. But when you do shopper well, it just amplifies what you're doing on the consumer side as well as, the, as the, the retail side. It's just not a traditional function. So that would be my answer. I love that. Focus on the shopper. Um, so if there's any more questions, guys, pop them into the chat now. But I think we're pretty good. So, Greg, I want to thank you so much for your time. This was amazing. Learned so much. I'm sure the rest of the audience did as well. Um, thank you for joining us. And, and again, kicking off our CHFA Now uh, virtual week. Um, for those in the audience who are still here, if you haven't registered for CHFA Now and you're able to uh, join us on uh, next week in Vancouver, we look forward to it. Greg, sorry, one more question popped in. Is there a social that we can follow you on? Uh, I don't really do a lot of social for work. You can find me on LinkedIn. And um, the shopperfirst.com website would be the two pieces if you want to have a, a side conversation on that, if you have any other questions. I think these hot tips really, uh, really worked out. So we, maybe we got to get you on social, <laughs> sharing all the great tips. I probably should, you. right? Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much again. Again, guys, if hopefully you can join us next week in Vancouver. And thanks for uh, spending your afternoon with us. We'll sign off here. Take have care. Have a great long weekend, guys. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.